caregivers and professional caregivers for people who are taking care of other people with dementia. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one counseling. We have support groups. Uh, we do educational seminars like this. Um, we have cultural programming. Um, we, we have a, a whole lot of different ways to um, support the caregiver. So if anybody is interested in, in finding out more, you are more than welcome to um, check out our website, which you probably have if you uh, registered here. Um, you can also um, call our helpline, which is 646-744-2900 and get more information. Um, I am going to now record. Oh, no, we, were, we did record. Um, wait, Julie, you recorded already? I just started. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, Fagy Horowitz, um, who is presenting tonight. Um, Fagy is a veteran community activist. Um, she spent many years in social services, both as an executive and as a board member of nonprofits. She developed programs, conducted political advocacy, and consulted for various groups, including boutique nonprofits, citywide, and, nat and national organizations. She is a co-founder of a shelter for homeless girls, a synagogue, and a new forum for midlife women. Figgy currently serves as Director of Communications for Caring Professionals Home Care and is a freelance writer and columnist. She is a certified uh, aging in place specialist by the National Association of Home Builders. Um, Karen, uh, Karen Kind's policy is that we do not endorse any one service or vendor, but we are really, really excited to have her and to hear um, everything that she has to teach us tonight. So, Figgy. Thank you, Adina. Adina and I got acquainted, I think we met at some conference almost two years ago. And of course I knew what Karen Kind was since I'm in senior services a couple of years. Um, but we are helping each other out, navigate certain things, and um, it's all about helping families. And that's really why I made the transition from the nonprofit world to uh, the home care agency where I work. So let me tell you a little bit about why I learned about home mods and went ahead and got myself certified as a, an aging in place specialist. Um, I usually don't talk about this. I've given this workshop many times, but um, I don't know. I feel particularly comfortable now. I noticed this was before COVID. I saw a st an article in Long Island Newsday about uh, more people wanting to age in place um, on Long Island, which is where I live. I li live right near the Nassau Queens border. And I investigated a little bit and followed up with some phone calls and one thing led to the other. And I said to myself, as soon as COVID kicked in, people are not sending their parents to um, to assisted livings. And as we know, today, uh, actually today there were some new statistics about aggregate uh, living for seniors and people, the numbers are down, down, down. In certain states, it's really low, like in California. Um, and here in the New York area, it's definitely been been reduced. Um, somebody called me a couple of weeks ago about an assisted living on Long Island that is half full. And would I be interested in, in, in being the director of marketing? I said, no, thank you. Who, who wants to try to pull people into assisted livings now? So my point is more, it's, we always knew it was the healthiest, safest thing and best for the senior. Um, but now it's, it's much more compelling. So I went ahead and trained in aging in place, meaning knowing how to prepare an environment for a senior. And basically the idea is to, to have the retirement center at home. And what I'm going to be talking about in the first half is really, um, the bigger things to do, not the minor little um, grab bars and, and, and window guards that we think of when we think of home improvements for seniors. The first half is my usual talk on home modifications, aging, changing your space to age in place is what I like to call it. And it's about the things that require a contractor or an installer or a handyman. Um, and I'll tell you our primary goals later, but first I, I, I wanna address the, the variety of people who are with us tonight. I don't know you, I see some names. Um, I'm assuming that, that you're all planners. 
planners of one kind or another. I am only 62, but I am now a planner um, about aging in place because about, let's see, about seven years ago, I broke my ankle in two places and I was confined to my bedroom, which has an ensuite bathroom. And I knew the bathroom would be okay because I could wheel the wheelchair under the counter. There's an area which is great for makeup. Um, it has a mirror. Either the woman before, who lived in the house before me had installed it so I could move under there. And the shower has a nice bench, like built in stone bench. She put in a steam shower and other amenities, but I knew that would work. But getting in was a problem because the threshold was just that quarter of an inch too high for me. And as we'll talk and we'll see later on, the, a, a quarter of an inch um, is really ideal for getting up. If it's beveled, you can go up to a half an inch. So the threshold was the problem. The, the width of the doorway, we could have wiggled. It wasn't a major problem, but I had enough space to maneuver. So I am a planner now. Because of my experience, I know that when the time comes, I'm going to have to do something about that doorway. Um, there are other people in the aging in place world that have family members with progressive or chronic conditions. Uh, let's say Parkinson's. You need, you will, you know, you will be needing special modifications to allow um, the, the senior to age in place. It does change. It's going to get worse. So uh, whether it's turning on a light now or a faucet or bathroom challenges, we know that we need to plan if, so, if we have somebody with a chronic condition or a, um, a progressive disease. Then we have the group that some of you may be like this, who have a traumatic transformative event. Someone had a stroke, was in an accident. And this is true of uh, people with disabilities as well. There has to be immediate and accommodating modifications. So time is of the essence. The family is going to confer with the discharge planner, with the doctor, with the OT, the PT, and try to get things in place very quickly. Um, they're gonna network with the durable medical equipment providers. They may need a ramp or mobility changes. There may be changes that are sensory or cognitive. We're gonna talk about those. Um, so, and now we have a, a fourth category and that is the people who are coming home because of COVID from, they realize that that their environment is not safe for them, regardless of the assurances from Albany or the Department of Health. And they, they, it is their feeling that we cannot trust government to keep older people safe. So they are bringing them home, either to their own homes or back to the seniors' home. So all these people have to make immediate plans or middle-term plans or long-term plans. Um, a friend of mine built a house probably 25 years ago and I was shocked that she put in an elevator like, hello, she was in her low mid forties, whatever it was, she was planning ahead. She, she, she probably hired a pretty good consultant um, with universal design concepts, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about modifying what you have, the environment that you currently have for the um, comfort and um, independence of the senior. So this is very key right now. What is our goal? What is our goal when we make these big changes that necessitate a contractor or a licensed uh, um, workman? We want to provide supported independence at home for quality of life. So we work with the senior the family, the healthcare provider to deal with present and future needs as well as wants. Both are important because what good is it to change the space if the person can't can indulge in their hobby, the person can't paint, the person can't um, 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 do the thing enjoy music with surround sound. They have Bose speakers installed in their, in their library. We want to give the senior 
the opportunity to age in place and have access to the things they enjoy, whether it's their book club or their local community senior center that they attend or some outings. We wanna support independence at home with safety. So that being said as the overall goal, we have three primary objectives. One is life safety. The person shouldn't undergo severe risk. We need to keep that person safe. The second is fall prevention because you know, we know that falls are the biggest cause of a change in a person's cognitive and physical abilities. And the third, of course, is convenience and comfort. We want to make it easier to do independently the regular tasks and activities that, that the person enjoys, whether it's hobbies, photography, crafts, whatever, sewing on a sewing machine, quilting, whatever it is. Any questions so far? Adina, are we all, we're all on the same page. Great. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Thank you, Leslie. So the safety concerns are pretty obvious. The first one is exiting during a fire. We have to have easily accessible, <coughs> uncomplicated fire exits. The second is falls, and I'm not going into fall prevention because most people educate themselves first on this topic, the wires, the, the obstacles, the turns, and so on. I'm going to talk also when we about burn prevention. Um, most cooktops today have controls in the front. If you remember your grandmother's stove top, it, there was a panel with a clock in the back and the knobs could have been in the back. NG, not good. You don't want to have a senior reach across the hot burners to turn things off. The same idea is true in the electric stove top. If you have an electric stove, there should be a light to indicate when the surface is too hot to touch. So that's burn prevention, a different kind of prevention. We also don't want to have the person carry a hot pot too far from a stove to a counter or from the oven to a counter. So, or, um, or from one appliance to another area. So therefore, burns are a serious concern. And we'll talk later about the, the temperature of the water in the faucet and the bathroom, both shower, sink, and the third, the, the bathtub. Now I'm going to go to a word that we writers encounter all the time, and that is redundancy. In writing, Redundancy is not a good thing. You don't want to say the same thing twice. You don't want to use extra words. Cut, 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 edit, edit, edit. Um, we want it simple and spare. But when we talk about home modifications, redundancy is a very good, positive thing. And that's a redundancy. Intentional. Redundancy means doubling systems so that there is backup. For example, in your front hall, you have a fixture. You need light. You should have a fixture with multiple bulbs because the first bulb that burns out is a problem. But if you have a second and a third bulb there, you have a backup. So the multiple bulbs are a redundancy. Got it? Now I'll give you some more examples. We want backup systems in case something doesn't work or, or there's a problem. When we talk about smoke and carbon monoxide detectors, we want both visual alarms and audible alarms so that people with hearing loss or visual impairments will be alerted, right? And will get out. Again, this part of the talk is about regular seniors, not about people with dementia. We'll get to that in the second part. Now, similarly, another redundancy that we want is all hardwired alarms should have um, battery backup. We're, we want to be sure that they are reliable. And here's a non-electronic redundancy that you wouldn't think about, and we'll talk more about later when we get to the dementia patients. 
it is a smart idea to keep hazardous materials in a cabinet that is painted another color or you put a big piece of uh, brightly colored red or tape on it to indicate that there are contents inside that are hazardous in other words there's something that jolts you there's a an alert a a trigger that says hey this is not the regular this is not normal another thing might be to put in a child latch a safety those pl plastic pieces um, in a cabinet door to remind you hey stop think this cabinet contains the bleaches the the peroxide the hazardous materials so this is another way we deal with safety issues is we have redundancies in our systems, backups, right? Now, let's talk for a moment about communication systems and technology. Um, communication systems and technology allow both the individual and the family members or caregivers to communicate and to in case of an emergency or to check to check up right so traditionally um, um, monitoring systems were bracelets or necklaces and they gave the the senior and the family peace of mind while the senior was sleeping or the senior went for a walk to the library um, everyone knew that they could press the panic button and somebody would get in touch and this allowed people to live independently. Now, I see some of us are, are, are not ancient and we are not going to march around town with this visible badge saying, I am a senior, I am at risk. Most parents do, or, or do not want to wear a bracelet or a necklace. Today, I'm telling you the good news, which you probably know already, that these features um, these communication features can be incorporated into tablets, laptops, or Wi-Fi enabled devices. You even, I mean, they get very sophisticated um, and they, some of them can even insist that you, you talk. If, if, if the system hasn't heard from you in 45 minutes, it can be programmed to, to say, hello, are you awake? Are you there? Hi, Audrey, just check it up. Um, there are many features that alert the children and the caregivers about the client situation and can notify um, them immediately in the event of distress. They are also portable. So if you go away for the weekend, you can take them with. Um, some come with monitoring services. Some are fully automated. Um, so if you have a parent or a family member or your kids are pressuring you, outsource the research and decide what you want. Um, this is very often a source of conflict between parents and adult children. Um, so sometimes, you know, if necessary, a geriatric care manager can be of assistance. But my point is there are options and they have backups built in with them. Ditto, which brings me to the final, um, the final subtopic here. And then, then we'll, we'll almost be ready to pause for questions. A lot of these systems that you can buy today, they're not expensive. I, I priced them Christmas time. They're really not expensive. They're under $400, something new and highly rated. Um, many of them do are multi-purpose. They are also security systems that guard against break-ins, fire, as well as medical distress. So you can buy a comprehensive package, um, a comprehensive package that includes both safety and monitoring. And they have um, wireless smart installation. So you just, it's not complicated, trust me. Even I was able to install a wireless network adapter or something, a wireless extender network. And it promised to be very easy and I managed to do it. So this is, I trust this, this research on the net. 
Um, some of them can also control the thermostat remotely and can turn on lights. They can all be programmed for many features. You may need more help, but um, why not have one-stop shop for the locks the, uh, and all the systems as well as the medical distress? So really, um, technology can be of tremendous help as a in terms of monitoring, in terms of safety, security, and as a um, as a redundancy. One more thing, and then we're going to pause for questions. I want to emphasize, and this is because I've seen it, not because I've experienced, I've seen it as an outsider. You go into the home of a senior or you pay a condolence call. We Jews call it a shiva call, right? During the week after the passing of the individuals. And you see, it just jumps out at you that wooden um, handrail that they installed in the steps or a ramp that they installed. There is no reason that you have to make the home look like an institution if you are doing modifications. Let's keep it nice. Let's pay attention to the aesthetics. Um, no one, the senior doesn't like living in an institution like setting. You may have had to have brought in a, 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 a hospital bed. You may have installed the ramp, but you don't have, have to um, leave it at that. Use your decorators your inner decorator's eye. Paint the, the railing. If you're widening the doorway, paint the woodwork and repaper the hallway. And if you have some, some extra rolls of wallpaper in the closet, now's the time to use it. Similarly, if you have to install a ramp in the front, jumps right out right at you, you can install some planters with bright, colored flowers in the spring and summer on either side. It will, and you'll use your judgment so it won't obstruct the wheelchair or the mobility aid, but it'll be attractive to look at. Similarly, you can hang something um, over the entryway where you've added a smaller ramp. Remember to integrate whatever modifications you have made into the existing decor. Okay, I'm stopping for now. Adina, I'm going to drink and you're going to see if there are questions. Um, there are no questions. I'm, I'm wondering, especially as you're talking about ramps and also, like, I guess, putting um, together decor, if you can speak a bit about um, stair lifts and how, how that, what, what should people be looking for with that? Um, and, and an added plus would be, how, how do we make that look attractive and, and something within the ambiance of the home? Well, two comments. I'll answer the first one first and the second one second. Okay. Um, the, the stair lift all depends on what the home is like. And that's why these people are trained to, to look in, in their equipment. You know, you have attached homes that are 100 years old, like my old neighborhood, um, you, you, you have very little maneuverability. The, the townhouse could be 18 feet wide and you walk into a staircase, like what are you gonna do? You can't really do much. It all depends on what's available. An aunt and uncle of mine installed like a whole elevator shaft outside the home. There are pneumatic tubes. There's the middle, you can do it in the middle of the house. It all depends on the home and of course the resources. Any vendor is gonna have to, is gonna have to be a, a, an approved vendor for a certain type of equipment. You know, there, there are rules here. So, so that depends on the space. To answer the question, what can you do with regard to a lift? Not that much, but if you're doing it way in advance, you can incorporate it into the, into the middle of the home, meaning um, where there are not gonna be any windows anyhow. So that's where you would wanna design it. And some, some people who construct homes, um, and we learned about this, I haven't done this one yet. I haven't been on a consult for new construction, but um, we'll allow the space and they'll install it later on. Or if you knock out, here's something else. If you knock out a fireplace in a multi-story home, you have the whole area to use. 
you know, from the, the first floor up to the roof and you have where it should move up and down. So that that's something to think about. You need to, you need expert help and I can't make one particular um, recommendation. So if there are no questions, we're going to go on to talk about some of the, uh, are there questions? Jiggy, yeah, I think, I think uh, somebody has her hand up. Um, hold on, let me see. Do you have, do you have a question, Ruchi? Let me ask. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, so my quick question is, um, I, I missed the part before about um, installing something in, in a phone or a device like that to track your, you know, the senior. I, I, I would actually do this for both my parents and I, I missed exactly that whole part of how do I track them and, and check on them and that kind of that kind of thing. Okay, I didn't talk about phones. I did not talk about phones, but phones are, there are systems in place. You just Google, but okay. you I'll give you the, the things that you can buy in a, in a comprehensive system. You can buy um, security, okay? okay? That requires a periodic proactive response. Okay. You, you can buy a system that has an easy call for assistance that's voice activated. You can have one in, in the tablet. In, okay. in a laptop um, and, or any Wi-Fi enabled device that means a phone and they are portable. They can also, uh, that's a safety package. They okay. can also have the features of, of a monitoring system as well as, um, you know, alarms and, and <laughs> a lighting and thermostat adjustments and, and lock adjustments. Okay, so something like um, like a smart television type of thing, it could be installed into something like that? Yeah, the, the systems that they have now are multi-purpose. Okay, so you great. don't have to make yourself crazy. And you have to also decide what's, what's important and what's less important. What are your priorities? Are your priorities call for assistance, security of the house, or is it mobility within the house? If I don't, or is it, um, mobility when he, he goes out in the community. Right. Um, um, we all, cameras are very cheap, they're $15 each and, and one in each room. But parents, if they realize, might find that very invasive. Right. Uh, so, you know, okay. these I are positive things. And there, that's why I mentioned the geriatric care manager at that point in the discussion, because right. parents don't want to be monitors. They want to feel independent and our goal here is as i said in the beginning you probably missed it supported independence right okay i understand thank you safety and their ability to do whatever they right. enjoy doing okay so let's thank get you to, you're welcome let's get to some considerations that apply across the home and then we'll get to we'll go to individual rooms and that will be the end of, uh, more or less the end of part one. So doors are simple. We mentioned doors before. Widening doors is one of the first things you address. We wanna be sure that there's enough clearance at knuckle height for wheelchair access and to maneuver. So the popular choices are, listen and write, write them down if, if, if they make, they are a need. Sliding doors, which we understand, Okay, usually a track at the top. Pocket doors, which slide into a pocket between two walls. In other words, you have a double wall and the door slides right in, you don't see it. And the third option is very trendy and very pretty. Um, and that's a barn door. Um, when my father's home, when my father moved into a new home probably about eight years ago, I thought they had barn doors because they were trendy they were in little did i know till later his wife was in a wheelchair and that is much easier you want to minimize the swing of a door so barn doors are a great option you have the a lot of width the doors hang on a track over the um over the the at the entryway and on both sides the doors are basically hanging on the walls now 
These are very in, as I said, my daughter just redid a house. So I call it a bungalow, but she calls it farmhouse style. And she has barn doors, um, which keep the kids from swinging the, um, open and closed and make it easier to pass by, right in her, in her kitchen area. So barn doors allow you ease of e egress and ingress. Now, that's, what, that's a key concern. Sound is an important concern. Now, generally, I see people, you know, on the screen who are at home. Generally, your couch, your, your um, draperies, the random things you have in a house will absorb ambient sound. Um, you have fabrics. However, um, HVAC, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning can be noisy. So when a person has a hearing impairment um, or their hearing just decreases, um, then, then it hits them more strongly. Or if they have a hearing impairment and they want to turn the volume on high, imagine this situation. The guy's okay, but when the cleaning woman comes with his hearing impairment, the, the, the vacuum cleaner really, really bothers him. Or the air conditioning system is so old, it makes a racket. So you may want to adjust that. Or similarly, let's continue the example. The guy um, is a football fan and he has a study with a big flat screen and five and, and Sunday afternoon, he's watching football and he's turning the volume on really high. His wife in the next room, which is a kitchen with fancy glass tiles, has her Sunday afternoon standing appointment to talk to the teenage granddaughters right before their dinner, okay? And he's making a racket in the next room with the football game on really, really loud. So because the glass tiles um, exacerbate the sound and because he has it on high, um, you're gonna have a problem. So sometimes you, you do need to install acoustic tile or to soundproof a room if a person is hard of hearing and likes to listen to, you know, um, classical music with a lot of clashing cymbals or, or football. So this is something you want to pay attention to. You also, if you think about it, um, people who are older are more sensitive to allergens, to humidity fluctuations, to temperature. Um, also, we, we may develop chronic asthma or certain respiratory issues. So you want to have a, a ventilation system that is good, that is easy to adjust. You also want the ventilation system because God forbid somebody has an odor issue, you want that pulled out, you want that vented out. So you're going to want a good ventilation system or maybe upgrade, maybe you just need to upgrade um, the thermostat, the controls. Now, typically the, the contractor installs the controls of a thermostat at 48 inches or higher. So the kids can't touch it. That's like the standard. You want this much lower. You want this less than 48 inches. You want, you want to be able to reach that if you're in a wheelchair or a scooter. You also want the large digital readout and up and down arrows. And let's take this moment to talk about other controls in a home. Normally, electrical outlets are a little higher. We want them at 24 inches. So they're easily accessible from, like I said, a wheelchair or a scooter. You want the switches at 48 inches or lower because you don't want to have to stretch too far. Stretching is hard. Stretching pulls. Um, so we want, let, just to repeat, we want the switches at 48 inches or below. We want the electrical outlets at 24 inches. And if we also want what we call three-way switches. Now, three-way switches doesn't mean a dimmer with three settings. A three-way switch means you can turn it on and off in one place and on and off in another place. And it's very logical 
because you go out of your bedroom, just picture this, to go to the bathroom or to answer the door. Um, you want to turn the switch, the light switch on as soon as you come out of the bedroom, walk down the hall, open the door, and then let's say you go into the living room. You want another switch at the end of the hallway. So that we call that three-way controls. On, off in one place, on, off in another place. This way, no one nego is negotiating an area without adequate lighting. Now, sometimes this is tricky. Um, um, so you would want to install a motion sensor. Think about closets um, of years ago. How were the closet lights turned on? Not by a switch, by a string, right, in the middle of the closet. That's very hard for an older person, besides the height. So let's say you make the string longer, but the reaching is a problem. So you want to have either a motion sensor or install a light switch in the closet. And closets are tricky. You don't want to trip and fall. So closets particularly, um, there are no lights, there are no windows. You need to have good lighting. Okay, so. That covers some of the controls, right? Electricity, we talked about ventilation, we talked about lights. We also want to have easy controls for the garage doors, which is standard today, and also the house lights. The house lights should go on, um, so there's never a time when you walk in at, to darkness. Now, here's something you can control without a switch or without programming, and that is glare. Glare is very simple. You know, people, the nomads who lived in, in Sahara or in, in, in the Near East, everybody managed all that sunlight, okay? So if you're living, if your summer place, I'm oh, sorry, your winter place, your condo in Florida has a lot of light, or you have a southern exposure with three windows, you're going to want your lighting to have less intensity and less glare. You don't need so much lighting. You don't want it to bounce all over and to cause interference. So that pretty much covers lighting. Let's stop for a minute. Lighting and controls, any questions? Uh, there are no questions in the chat, so unless somebody has uh, a question. Okay, so let's go into the big one. We said our three concerns are life safety, um, fall prevention, and the third was um, convenience and comfort. So let's talk about fall safety and entryways and related matters. So if we want to keep the pre prevent falls and keep the person active and comfortable in their previous lifestyle for quality of life, we need the entryways to be optimal, okay? You have to go out, you wanna to go to the grocery store, you wanna to go to the drugstore when you wanna go. You can otherwise have it delivered, the, the things delivered. You, wanna, you need to go to doctors, you wanna get in and out easily and safely. Therefore, you need to have safe stairs, you, you, will, you may need a ramp, a lift, an elevator, a foldable lamp. I'm only going to talk for the moment about ramps because ramps are not regulated. You don't need an approved ramp. You can get your nephew to knock something together because it doesn't have to follow codes. So very often there are mistakes made with ramps. Um, ramps can be too steep. There are no landings. There should be a landing when the thing turns and at the top and at the bottom. Um, you need curbs to keep the mobility aid from veering off and you fall down to the grass below. You need curbs on the sides. You need guardrails on both sides. You also want to have weather resistant um, uh, materials not, that are non-slip. You you're going to go out in the rain. You have that doctor's appointment with that specialist. You are going. So you need to have it uh, made of non-slippery material um, when there's inclement weather. You also want to have, whether you're living in Florida, you have a southern exposure, whatever, you may want to have a, a canopy 
so that you can go out and straight into the car without any problems. Um, and we talked about the transition, the optimal um, transition at the top of the bottom is the same as a threshold to the bathroom in my example. And the optimal transition is a quarter of an inch. And if you have a beveled transition, you edge, if it's slanted, then you can go up to a half an inch, but no more. You wanna be sure it's well lit. You wanna also have um, um, visual cues, like contrasting materials and colors. It shouldn't look like the rest of the place. You should be able to notice it and see it, but it shouldn't be awful. Paint it um, um, a pleasing color that goes with the outside of the house. So, um, so ramps are necessary, but they can be done properly if you are aware or you check it out. Another, ent another entryway um, issue is even if you don't need a ramp, you are coming, a senior is coming home with packages. They went to the library, they picked up the meds. You, they want and need a place to put something down at the entry so that they can maintain their balance and open the door safely. So you want a shelf, a cabinet, a little bench, um, um, something to hold your items so that you can open the door. Um, another thing is at the entry, you want the mailbox. You don't want the slot at the bottom of the door anymore. NG, not good, because obviously the slot gets all the mail and the mail ends up on the floor and that's a falling hazard, right? Um, the locks on the outside of the doorway should be easy to open. So lever styles, lever style hardware is, is very good because you don't have to twist the wrist and you can do it with one hand. And that's good for people who have trouble using a key. Um, you also have the option of a push button or remote deadbolt. Um, um, you, like we said before, but now I'm saying it again, you need good lighting in the entryway so that, so that it is safe and that you can easily come in and out. A sentence or two about steps, and then we'll start going room by room. Not all the rooms, but the, the, the big problematic challenging rooms. Um, steps, steps are something everyone's aware of. We want to have closed risers, meaning not those floating staircases that were so cool about 20 years ago. You know, circular staircases, you know, with, with open air between the treads. Not good. You need closed risers. You also want to have the edges non-slip, okay? Uh, because even if the person is steady on their feet, what about when they're going to be using a, a walker or a, another, a cane, a, what we call a mobility aid. And we also want to have, alongside the steps, continuous handrails that you will paint, okay? So those are the issues. The general issues in entry and exit. And before we go into kitchens and bathrooms, the two big challenging rooms of the house, I just want to check on whether there are any questions. Um, none are in the chat. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Then I will go on. So the two big challenging rooms in the house, and we will talk about others when we talk about dementia patients. Your regular senior will have a need to make some modifications in the bathroom because instead of being a place for pampering, for beauty, um, the bathroom changes to a place of primary functions and critical use. The toilet, the tub, the shower, the sink. It is no longer a storage space for beauty items, for manicures, for cleaning supplies, for towels. We are going, 
it is ideal to get rid of all of that in the bathroom and only keep that which you need for bathroom, shower, shaving, washing up, and toileting, obviously. You don't want extras. And many people, and you, we'll talk, okay, I'll save that for a moment. You want to have differing height counters, because if you're in a wheelchair, you need it lower. You also need nothing underneath. Like I said before, my current bathroom has a vanity sink, but there's a little like bridge area before the shower where she had a little drawer with, I put my makeup there at, inside and on the surface and also a, a mirror on top. So I can sit and put on my makeup and I have a little magnifying mirror, very nice and a little stool. You know, the classic bathroom vanity seat without a back. But when the time will come, I can slide a wheelchair underneath. It doesn't go straight to the floor. And I can all, currently, I slide my little stool underneath. So you want to have differing counter heights and sink heights that allow a wheelchair to go underneath. You want the counters clear. You want to get rid of um, you want to get rid of doors because doors swing. So therefore, you, your storage that you will save for your critical needs um, should be drawers that pull out all the way so you don't have to stretch. Remember, we said that stretching is not good. We want to minimize stretching. Everything should be easily accessible. Um, the faucets, the faucets should be lever operated faucets. You pull it, it's easy, you don't have to twist your, your hand. Um, you also want to have, you also want to have seated access to the toilet. You want it high, you need some room. Um, and as we say again and again, but I'm going to say it for the first time here, when we talk about bathrooms, it's transitions that cause the biggest challenge and, you know, the, the chance of falling. When you're going in or out, when you're getting up, when you're getting into the bed, that's when the, the fall, the chances of falling increase. So you want to have seated access to the toilet as well as barrier-free shower to be able to wheel or walk straight in. So therefore your shower is not, now we're moving to showers, of no curbs, what we call a curbless shower. Now, if you, if you think about it, think about the cleaning, think of a curbless shower is going to, unless, how are you gonna keep the water from flooding the floor of the bathroom and making that a hazard because it'll be wet, right? The floor of the, of the bathroom is usually tiled. So if you have a curbless shower, even if you have, and we all know when our kids were younger and they used showers, the bathroom floor was always soaking wet. Now you don't want to put towels down now or bath mats there. So what, when you get older, you do need, like I said, the, the, the bathroom needs modification. One of the things you're going to do is put in a curbless shower with a drain right at the entrance. Uh, another trick is either in addition or instead, besides the center, the center drain, you install another drain at the opposite. The, uh, opposite of where you enter and you have a, a, a slightly inclined floor. It looks like so the water drains the other way. It doesn't go into the rest of the bathroom because there's a slope, the water goes the other way. And that's, and usually that second drain or third drain is under a seat, okay? Sometimes people put in folding seats Sometimes they have like, like I have in mind, like a, a stone bench, but optimal, optimally, the person should, should really not have to transition, should take the shower in some kind of bath chairs, you know, go in with, with something and stay in it, not transition in such a tricky place. Um, so, so, um, 
a bathroom shower is better obviously than a bathtub and if necessary you get rid of the shower or some people make a developmental um, or versatile um, bathroom plan so that it can be adapted as needs change like i said one of those changes should be getting rid of storage getting rid of a closet um there's because you don't want the door interference you don't want any barriers that's and there are people who who move the bathroom into another room let's say there's a laundry room nearby because there's the same pipes or a spare bedroom you want to make the bathroom bigger but at the same time keep in mind that even though you need to make modifications you want to preserve the dignity of the person using the bathroom so there has to be allowance for privacy right so you need a wider door but you do need a door whether it's a sliding door a pocket door whatever door you choose you want to have a door and even if there's an aid the aid can stand right outside in the beginning um, when you don't have acute needs but as things change the aid should be able to go in with you and two people should be able to maneuver besides the the walker or the the wheelchair so um i think that's basically it for bathrooms i'm thinking what else yeah move the towels <laughs> and one second there are some appliances you do need in a bathroom you need the shaver you need the hair dryer there are certain things you're not out putting somewhere else so therefore keep them safe put them in the garage like the kitchen the fancy kitchens have a garage like a pull down door that keeps them out of sight you don't want anything electrical near water it's safer to do it that way um i think there's a lot to say about bathrooms and there are a lot of choices but the, we've touched on the highlights no yeah. questions on bathrooms oh, okay uh, uh gabriella let me just uh unmute you there you go oh wait i think we you need to unmute oh, okay did I? Okay, great. I think I'm okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. So my question is, um, I would love to change the entire bathroom for my dad, but for the time being, I can't yet. And there's an actual bathtub and he would have to somehow step over it and get in. Are there any tricks to that? Any devices that could help him get into a bathtub safely and for using a shower not to take a bath but for the shower but it happens to be in the tub or getting in and out any kind of a device maybe a lift of some kind or a ram i don't know something i haven't seen it yeah and i would imagine that they're pretty risky because you don't there's such an incline that yeah such a hump to get over there are those bathtubs with the doors you see them advertised in the back yeah. of the yeah um, um baths are are not great no. if you, baths are not great yeah okay. the nice thing is you know here's where you know using a little psychology uh leslie we didn't forget about you meanwhile please unmute her so she can be next um uh, the nice thing is you can talk about it in terms of making it easier, safer, more glamorous, or you can have another person recommend it. That's the nice thing about um, doing a consult with a geriatric care manager. They're the in-between person. The, they manage those difficult issues. Um, and we wanna keep you safe or it's for your good is not gonna hold water. Or you can turn it around like this, Dad. We're at a calm time, not after he just slipped 20 minutes ago and your heart went into sank into your shoes. But you know, thinking about the future, um, ideally, how would you do? You think showering would work best for you? And you don't have to answer me now. Just start to think about it. If we did some changes in the bathroom, what would they look like? 
Um, I, and then when you do talk about it, you introduce certain ideas. We'll take out the towel, the, the towel closet, we'll, the, or the linen closet. We'll move the hamper into your bedroom because um, you do need the space and you want everything well lit um, and no tight corners. You know, you do need a designer. And if you're, and one thing I, I just touched on, I think I want to emphasize it now. If your senior is getting some OT or PT, you should involve the OT and the PT in whatever plans and modifications you are making, not just the doctor, because the OT PT knows the, the sensitivities and the fine motor skills and, and the weight bearing activities that, that he or she can do. So be smart, include your whole healthcare team. Okay, Leslie. Um, yep. Yeah. I just wanted to add for Gabriella, we actually had a, a family that did something that I'd never heard of before to their tub. So it was an immediate need and it is a, a person with dementia. She couldn't lift her leg over. So they actually found a contractor who comes and I, I do think it was, um, you know, a metal tub and they were able to cut it. Yeah. It was a, a ceramic with the metal underneath. Not the prettiest thing, okay? This is not any glamour thing, but it, it did the trick because they needed it immediately. They were coming from their summer home and they needed to act. And so it was, it was like, you know, cutting a, a, a good wedge out and that's what enabled it. Okay, good idea. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sue, I see your hand was up and then there's okay. another one from the chat. Oh. Yeah, so oh. I, it, it's funny because today I was talking to a friend of mine and she did that for her mom's bathtub. She had a wedge cut out of it and you just have to use it. Like she had to take off the shower doors and, and, re, um, and put a shower curtain. So, and she said that the guy told her to keep the wedge, the thing, the wedge that he cut out and eventually if they ever have to, they could put it back in. Also, there's that bathtub fitters. I think that it's called bathroom fitters, bathtub fitters, that they actually have. It's a, um, what do you call uh, I forgot the name of the, um, what kind of a fabrication it's made out of. Um, but they also have something that has like that door that you open to the bathtub and you just, you, you know, you just walk into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about, we mentioned that. Oh, I think right. that I did not mention before the next person brings it up is I did not mention grab bars in the bathtub. Right, grab bars. Now, grab bars are very basic. And so I don't spend a lot of time on it. But when we were in class, uh, way back when I studied this, the key point we heard again and again and were tested on is blocking. You cannot install it on a plasterboard on sheetrock. It has to be the the it has to be blocked. It has to be supported. Otherwise, it will come right out. So it's a simple thing, but it has to be done professionally. Okay. So if there's no other question, I will. There's, there's one more. Um, I don't know if um, a C wants to wants to um, uh, elaborate, but she, uh, she asks, um, do you recommend walk-in tub renovations? You know, it all depends on what else is going on in that bathroom. Like the way we talked about is a very simple thing. It's not pretty, but it's simple. If you're going to need, and if, if you're going to have a progressive situation and the person is in their late 80s, 90s, and mobility is getting harder, then you may want to invest and make a, a, a barrier-free um, shower package. They come prefabricated. They're not so expensive. You have the you have the water there anyhow. You'll have more space. That's why the the bathroom. Well, you can have simple solutions. Eventually, it's going to be a bigger problem. So you have to look at budget. You have to look at the the plans for the senior, as well as the size of the space and what else is available for some of those other functions. Is there a place, are they living in an apartment? Then they, you can't do too much, okay? Um, they're, everybody's situation is different. That's why we touch on things we're not so 
focus on giving individual solutions. Okay, there, there's a lot more technology. There are a lot more options than there were a couple of years ago. And, and since all you need is water and drainage, which is there anyhow, whether you have a bath or a shower, those pipes are there. It's a matter of how the place is configured. You're not, it's not like you're bringing anything in that's new. You're not bringing a, a water, dis, a, a garbage disposal and have to connect it to the, to the, um, to the, the water line for the dirty water. You know, it's, it's different. It's, it's, the systems are simple, but the space is different in everybody's home. And, and what else is there and what their needs are. So now we will go to the kitchen since we are done with the bathroom. The kitchen is the other big one. And if we, since we are not just focused on life safety and fall prevention, but we also want to maintain supported quality of life, supported comfort, supported activity. So your most luxurious kitchen with generous space and excellent design may not be so accessible. What do you need in a kitchen? You need to be able to store things. You need to be able to prepare food easily. You, you want to cook with convenience. You want to be able to serve the meal, eat, eat and do some, some cleanup. Because if you don't clean up the kitchen as you taught your kids, you know, the, the rain's going to have to come and wash the dishes, right? <laughs> you got to have constant upkeep there. So you need to have solutions for stove control, reaching the stove controls. You need to access high cabinets. Pullouts are very often an option. Or even that simple um, thing that they use in the stores that spring operated to reach up and get a cereal box, right, like a gun with a trigger. Um, you are also going to pay attention to the refrigerator. The refrigerator is a big one. Um, that often needs to be replaced if the refrigerator is old. Those old fashioned big refrigerators with the one door um, have a big swing and they, they, you don't have room. So the French style um, refrigerators that are in style now are really the best because you don't have a big swing Everything's accessible in the door and, and the shelves. And of course, the pantry, uh, the, I'm sorry, the freezer is easily pulled out. It's very easily accessible. So those are nice. And those um, allow you better freezer access and more fridge access. Um, you want to really do it nice. Then you have, you know, a water dispenser, an ice dispenser on the outside so the person doesn't have to reach and open the door. Um, you want to have, they all come now with very easily located temperature controls on the inside of the door. I have a new refrigerator, so I know. Um, um, some of these matters are, are, are standard today because they're built with what we said earlier, universal design. It's good for everybody, but it's especially good for people who are older or have limitations. You want to have pull down shelves for wall cabinets, which will make them more easily accessible. And in general, sliding is better than lifting. So, you know, those old fashioned doors, spice doors, remember, you know, it's a narrow little cabinet, you pull it out. And so that kind of idea for the pantry, you pull it out. Um, um, in the pantry, pull outs, pull downs, rotating shelves with frontal access, that's what you want. Now, so that's about storage. We just talked about the refrigerated storage and the dry storage. Let's talk about kitchen, uh, food prep in the kitchen. So that you, you're really going to have to look at the woman or man using the, the refrigerator's size and width because what is their seated height? What is optimal for uh, working there's certain things you do while you stand. There's certain things you do while you sit. So you have different counter heights. Um, and there are also certain things that can be made easier for the, for the person. Like, um, like I said earlier in the bathroom, all the drawers should have come out all the way. You should be able to reach inside. You don't want any tight corners. You don't want any dark corners. You want task lighting and other kinds of lighting. You want three levels of lighting. 
um, you want knee space under the cooktop and the controls in the front. Ditto for the, for the sink with easily manageable faucets. Now, wall ovens, not great because they're, they're high. And so, and you're handling something hot, you want a wall oven that's, that's lower, not two stack, but maybe just one. Um, microwaves, you don't want the microwave above the stovetop or the cooking appliance anymore. You want that aligned, built into the counter. You want a reversible swing so you can access it easily from both sides. You, and these are usually, you know, or, you know, they're standard. Uh, or a drawer style, a drawer style um, microwave. And the same goes with the dishwasher. There are now smaller dishwashers. If it's one or two seniors, they won't have to bend. They don't have to open that big door or to reach down to put something or retrieve something from the cutlery basket. So smaller um, drawer style, drawer height under the counter dishwashers are also something. And whatever you have, your large appliance is, and your small appliances, whatever appliances you have should have large controls and leverage for adjustment. Um, I think I talked about lighting, general lighting, task lighting, area lighting. Do include a motion sensor or a night light. Seniors always get up at night, whether it's the bathroom, whether it's the drink, whatever it is. They're restless, their sleep patterns aren't great. Expect the senior to go into the kitchen at night. Make sure that there is lighting there all the time, regardless of the time. Um, flooring, you're obviously gonna get rid of those throw rugs. And if, if you have anything, you have a non-skid mat near the, near the sink. One time when I gave this talk, someone said, I'm nervous about my father and, and the mat, even though it's non-skid. I said, if you're nervous, get rid of it. If something gives you agita and causes you worry, don't think about what Feige Harwood said, get rid of it or make an adjustment or figure it out. Your stress and your nerves are not the price you have to pay. So, the final word was flooring because we talked about what's on top. We talked about having varied lighting. We talked about floor. You want it to be seamless and easy to clean. Ceramic tile is not great because it has irregular surfaces and you know there's the, the, the grouting areas. It's not easy for a wheelchair or a walker to use it. So you want to have a smoother floor, but one that's not slippery that has some some traction, some friction. So we're going to pause now for some questions on the kitchen. I did not go through everything in the kitchen. Kitchen has a lot of functions. Um, um, and you're going to have to think about what are the favorite activities. Gabrielle, you have a question? No, that was just your hand. Um, you know, not everything can be done, but if a person has their specialty sauce or their specialty a uh, baked item, it would be wonderful to allow them to continue to do that. And you have, this takes planning, you, you know, you're spending money, but you also have to be realistic. What is most important? She can't make her strudel the old fashioned way, even though her mother made it that way in Hungary, because you need to roll it out and mix it, roll it out, let it dry, hang over the door, hang over the chair, slice that, peel the apple, slice the apples, roll it up, bake it. It's too many steps and you don't have that much room. But if she does other things, she has other specialties, try to figure it out. And that brings me, if we have no more questions, to a very important topic, and that is resources. How do we pay for this? And then we really have to get to the dementia specific stuff. I do wanna spend a few minutes, if we have no questions on kitchens, on resources. Now, Everybody's worried. People who are in their 80s and 90s do not expect to live this long and do not expect all these medical advances. Um, so when you're bringing people home from a facility or plan to keep them where they are, 
then you need to invest in making the space um, pleasant, uh, safe, as well as pleasant and convenient. How are you going to pay for this? Now, there is a little bit of help. And then I will give some information. I'm not giving away free money. On the city, county, and state level, there are some resources. If you live in the city, call DIFTA, Department for the Aging. If you live in the in a, the suburbs, like I do, you call the county. They always have a Department of Senior Services. In the city, they do a lot of the things themselves, and some they outsource for the county. I called Nassau County um, after I saw that article in Long Island Newsday about people staying home and they also identified some resources. So I picked up the phone and they say, well, we outsource it. They didn't use that word, but that was the general idea to this and this organization. Basically, depending on income and age, the resources are available depending on income and age. Um, some of them may cover simple window guards and grab bars for the bathrooms. And there are some weatherization programs which will provide new windows in the home so that you know, to conserve energy and to keep the, the person safe. In the city, most seniors by now know about the weatherization program. And if they didn't, their landlord certainly took care of it and got free windows for the whole building a while back. It's based on the proportion of older people in the building, whatever it is. Um, so the first stop is your county or city department for the aging. They, they will probably send you to another organization and you will get help with the little things. Uh, it, people are really rock bottom poor here in Long Island. We have two organizations that help vets that really take on projects, sort of like Habitat for Humanity type of idea. Te you know, once you're approved, the team comes and they do a lot of things, but that's not very typical. Medicare and Medicaid do not generally cover home modifications. If you are lucky enough that your parent um, bought long-term care insurance, they will cover sometimes some policies, equipment that help with ADLs, activities of daily living. They will not put in um, um, a new kitchen. They will not do anything major, but they will, they may pay for a ramp or something like that. Not all policies cover that, but some do. Uh, John Hancock will. Generally, they don't. So I don't want to mislead you. Um, and, and set up your expectations. However, the most popular resource people consider is a reverse mortgage. Now, way back when reverse mortgages first came out about 30 years ago, they got a terrible name because they were unscrupulous lenders who charged you high interest rates and you landed up owing more money than the house was worth. The idea of the reverse mortgage is to give people cash for home equity so they could stay in their homes longer, okay? And not use up all their money and keep them safe and secure in their environment. So um, the feds did come and improve reverse mortgages. They made substantial improvements about seven years ago. It's the prime method for financing aging in place modifications. Basically, and I looked into it, because I'm the right age now, you have to be 62 or older, you have to own your own home. You obviously have to have a lot of equity and you know owe very little on the home. Basically, the idea is it, it converts home equity into cash. And the lender will give you either a lump sum or a credit line or monthly payments or a combination of all of this. Now, these are income tax-free funds that you will used to make home improvements. You don't owe anything for this money that you borrowed until you die or leave the house. And if you die, it's obviously um, um, your inheritors who have to have a choice. Either they buy, you know, it's worked out. Either they, they buy, they pay what's, what's owed or, or the, it is, it can be sold, whatever it is. You don't owe anything until the last spouse um, dies or leaves the home. So you, the idea, like I said, is to keep the, the seniors in the house and 
in their environment that they're used to. And so if you take out a reverse mortgage, you have money to pay for home improvements. The other big use of a reverse mortgage is to pay for home care. Side issue, side question, side fact. Um, and when I said you don't have to pay anything back, I mean both the principal and the interest. You, if you use the money, not for home care, but to make home improvements, you can get federal income tax deductions on those home improvements and also in some states as well. So, you know, it's not my job to teach you or to direct you, but this is a, a source for a nice chunk of change to make those modifications um, and it will reduce, yes, it will reduce the money that the, that the children will get, the heirs will get, but um, your, your senior stays there safely and is reaping the benefits of having bought a home and paid off most or if not all of the mortgage years back. So for home, so that's basically the end of my talk, uh, my general talk that I do for seniors on home modifications. All kinds of seniors, all levels of planning and so on. And before I go into um, some dementia specific things and areas, I have plenty of time. I wanna pause for some questions. Adina, any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. Well, thank you for everyone who's still with me because uh, <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> talking about serious things and now it's gonna get even more serious, okay? Because now we are going to talk about how dementia affects safety. Um, and, can I just, I, I, there is a question that just came up. Somebody's asking about tile floors. Well, there are all kinds of tile floors. <laughs> Uh, would you mind on um, linoleum elaborating? What? Um, I, I address tile floors in a bathroom and in a and in a kitchen. Um, the main thing is whatever they're made of and whatever finish they have should be non-slip. And I made the point that in a kitchen, um, um, tiles are not easy because. There's the area between the tiles that can be difficult for someone in a wheelchair and for someone with a mobility aid. When we say a mobility aid, we mean a cane, uh, a four-pronged cane, a, a walker, a scooter, any kind of aid that helps you be mobile. So it's not best. You also want to have rough areas and where it's very smooth. Um, you may want to install some, some friction or some tape um, if they're big open areas, you know, what was a, a plus when one had a family or one had a large sprawling suburban home or a stately um, um, two level colonial can be a negative um, when you get older. And there are people in my neighborhood who find themselves living in just on the first floor. Uh, some, a couple told me we either we're selling the house and moving into a condo like six blocks down, or we have to do some major changes to the house. And they opted because they liked their location. They were close with their neighbors. It wasn't far from their kids. The synagogue was across the street. Um, they decided that they are staying. My friend, because of COVID, left the city. Um, her condo is not ready in the neighborhood. She said I, you know, she was ready to move. So she was going to rent another condo. And I said to her, why don't you consider a house? You're coming from the city. I know her life. She never lived in a house ever, ever. She's 60 something. She never lived in a house. So I said, consider a house. She said, but, but Faye, I need a bedroom on the first floor. I don't know if she needs it this minute, but She's going to need a bedroom on the first floor. I said, there are houses in this neighborhood with bedrooms on the first floor. Take a look. She called the realtor. Guess what? She's renting a house in the neighborhood with a bedroom on the first floor. Um, so, and the people I referenced before, they changed their house. They did not put in an elevator. They did not put in a lift. They reconfigured. They have a nice corner house. 
they don't, you know, I guess they didn't need the, the backyard way back, but the bottom line is they have the space and they have, they now have a bedroom and they, they invested some money and they're comfortable and the upstairs doesn't get heated and uh, is ignored most of, most of the time. So that is the story. Short breaths for Fagy, and then we will talk about dementia specifically and how that impacts um, the home. Now, most of the things I'm going to talk about are not modifications per se. You'd have to call them safety implementation, safety improvements. They're not the big um, contractor related pricey items like a uh, showerless tub or uh, um, a new a new dishwasher or a French style cabinet style refrigerator. No. It's a different set of changes. Now, how does let's let's start from the question, how does dementia affect safety? So we know that dementia and its various forms affect changes in the brain as well as the body that will affect safety. So depending on the stage of the disease, there are a couple of things that may change. A person's judgment may be impaired. They may forget how to use the household appliances. They no longer know how to turn on a dishwasher. Their sense of time and place can be um, affected. They can get lost on their own street. Now we're talking the serious stuff. These changes of neurological changes and body changes can cause very strange behaviors and a lot of emotions and a lot of anger and a lot of fear. You're going to the telephone. You're calling the police on me. Um, a lot of suspicion. Um, where are you going? Why are you leaving me? Or the reverse. Who's that at the door? I'm not letting anybody in. There, there are serious concerns there. And then, of course, there's physical ability the person may have trouble with balance because of the neurological damage. The senses, there are changes in vision, hearing, sensitivity to temperatures or depth, depth perception. It's not necessarily the organ, the nose, the eyes, the ears, but it's the brain, of course, processing that information that is impaired. So the signals are going but they're to the, to the brain, but they're not being read. However, with some creativity and flexibility, you can create a home environment that is both safe and supportive of the person's need for social interaction and meaningful activity. And you know what we mean by meaningful activity. It's not playing cards all day. It's you know engaging in things that the person enjoys. So here again, we're gonna have some guiding principles. Last time I said, in the first half, I talked about the guiding principles being life safety, fall prevention, and, um, and supported comfort. So you can do the things you want. And here, we're gonna tack on two key, um, two key factors. And that is, they're pretty simple, they're not, exactly the same, but the urgency is different. And one is frequent assessments, reevaluate and reevaluate and reevaluate on a regular basis. Abilities vary greatly among people with dementia and can disappear very suddenly. So you want to look, regularly evaluate balance, coordination, strength, the ability to sit, stand, walk, with or without assistance. And the same thing with the cognitive impairments. You're gonna pay attention to when they're covering up, when they're, when they're fine, when they're starting to cover up. Oh, I recognize you, but you're not gonna put them on the spot and say, who am I, right? You look lovely and get very smart about engaging in conversation to elicit some clues, but later on, it becomes obvious that there are further issues. So we want to hear from other family members, caregivers, and of course, talk to the healthcare providers 
and the eighth. Now, we, I'm gonna use some words which you use all, you hear all the time, but since I'm addressing safety, I, I need to bring them up. Orientation. <coughs> um, we want to look, notice the ability of the senior to correctly identify and be aware of who he is, where he is, what's the time of the year, the date, and we know that this orientation can be caused by a short-term issue, by medication, by neurological issues connected with the dementia, or you know, we all know, or or something simple, which has profound effects. You know, I didn't know this, but because of my grandmother, and and, and I learned this with my mother-in-law as well. I, I happened to know, and she was so grateful, and her children were so grateful that I told them when they start talking wacky and you think dementia is there, it very often can be a UTI which needs very, very rapid um, antibiotic, and then they're fine, but they act disoriented, and it's not dementia. Alertness. You know, we know what alertness means. It means the level of arousal. Does the person seem sleepy? Does he have a hard time staying awake? And this, again, can be caused by, by medication or by the dementia or a different medical condition. So it's three choices and you have to pay attention for both the orientation issues and the alertness issues. It could be the dementia, it could be a medical condition, it can be a medication. They can cause all kinds of responses that are very disturbing. And then there's memory, of course, the short-term and the long-term memory. So. When we talk about assess and reassess, you're gonna start training yourself to look at the house with different glasses from the, your loved one's compromised perspective. How does this room look? Can they do this in the library? Can, can, they, can they get to the easy chair from the desk? Simple transitions, simple activities. Can they turn on the music or is it not too hard? Um, we all, we know that people have difficulty following instructions and accurately interpreting the world around them and making sound choices. So even if your loved one is managing pretty well, you want to prepare for the future and keep going around the house when you visit and when, they, when they're sleeping or when they're engaged in an activity. What are they doing now that they might not be able to do in the future? You always have your antenna, just like for the alertness and the orientation, you wanna have your antenna constantly scanning what's the, their safety issues and um, um, management issues. You also wanna consider that if you are going to make some changes in the house, not forget about moving them somewhere. They respond very dramatically to changes. They can be very unsettling to have a couch disappear one day and the two matching club chairs. Big changes like redecorating can be very alarming. So what I would suggest is what you know already, keep a notebook, write things down, keep track of your observations, Compare notes with your siblings, compare notes with the aides, compare and talk to the doctor and the people who come to the house for OT or PT or whatever the service that they are getting. And report changes. I'm not going to go through all the things now because um, I want to do it in the right place. But when we talk about, I just want to touch on things you might want to pay attention to. What, um, as you do your tour of the house, keeping your parent or loved one in mind. The tripping hazards are obvious. Um, you wanna keep the walkways well lit. They're still walking, but you want it well lit. You wanna improve laundry room safety. Um, those packs, those liquid detergent packs are very poisonous. You know, you're supposed to call poison control as soon as a baby ingests one, an adult can ingest one too. And it's not, it's really serious. Later, we're gonna talk about posting certain numbers and poison control is gonna be one of them. Um, you may want to 
when you do your tour of the house, you might go into the boiler room and say, hey, maybe I should lower the temperature of the hot water. Maybe it's smarter to keep the medications in a locked cabinet. Um, what if she gets locked out? She goes down the street to meet a friend. It's the springtime. And the friend called and let's get out. Let's enjoy. And they each meet and they sit on the park bench. Classic, wonderful situation. You're so proud. She makes her own decisions. She has her own little excursions, but she gets locked out. You have to have a place or she might forget her place where she keeps her, her spare key. You have to have enough keys. She still can handle the key, but she might be forgetful. I left the house Saturday night. I was in Brooklyn already. And I called my son-in-law and I said, I think I didn't close the combination upstairs. And the next morning when I saw him, I said, and he agreed, he went, he was going out anyhow in the car. I said, was I right? Did I forget to lock the door? He said, yes, you did forget to lock the door. So I caught myself. I wasn't disoriented, but you know, we can't rely on, on memory and the precautions being taken. So you have to think strategically in each room and that's going to change again and again because you don't want the home to be, too, to be restrictive you want to encourage social interaction and hobbies and independence. And you want to be her to be able to play mahjong with her friend when she comes over. And you want her to be able to do scrapbooking, but you don't want her to trip. Uh, when the stuff is on, on the side, you want to maybe have a, an arts cart. You want to have a dedicated games table where, where her cards are all the time. So, we look at existing activities as well as spaces a little bit differently. We, we want to have designated areas. Um, I used to think, I used to think it was so, um, so typical of a certain age to have a little, remember those little corner uh, telephone tables, both my grandmothers had them. In the hallway, they had a little telephone table with the phone book and the yellow pages, and they would sit there and talk on the phone, right, to their sisters, whatever. It was a social activity. It's not like now. We, we're always on the phone. We're doing 14 other things while we're on the phone. We're in the shed. We're in the bathtub. But we're on the phone talking remotely. But I, this is the way I think about it. Think about it like a dedicated phone area. She can't be doing Pick, grabbing the 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 cordless and and running to the cordless, grabbing it while she's doing something. Like maybe make up a time to talk. Mama, is this a good time? Um, and and give her time to settle herself. Or should I call back in ten minutes? She's out of the bathroom already, but she hasn't adjusted everything that she needs to adjust. She hasn't closed the door to the bathroom. So we need dedicated spaces, perhaps, safer spaces for certain activities. Does that make sense? Okay. The second major concern, we said the first is assess, reassess, reevaluate, think strategically. The second one is very basic, minimize and reduce danger. So what does that mean? That means you're going to have a special danger zone. Take a, take a TV armoire, take a closet, take a um, special space where you will place the cleaning products, the dangerous stuff, the bleach, the mothballs, the insecticide, the, the dangerous things that are not regularly used, the paint, the turpentine, the sharp knives that you don't use on a regular basis, the hand and power tools. And you're going to lock it. Um, certain things you need in certain areas, okay? You do need some sharp knives in the kitchen. Um, you do need um, the laundry detergent, let's say, in the laundry area. You're going to want to put child-proof doorknob covers or cabinet locks on these places. Not everything can be transported to the danger zone, but having a danger zone is a very a dedicated danger zone plus certain locked and secure areas is the way to go. Um, and the same thing is true of the things she takes 
every day the medications you don't want them all around you want them in a secure place we know that this is where they are along with the schedule along with the dispenser it's not necessarily the bathroom you want it visible you want it accessible that is the place um um you may want to keep it locked when when dementia gets uh, or now you may want to you you should keep it locked but it needs to be in a place where where you are reminded that it is there and that the the aide or the caregiver will will access it and then lock it again okay you're going to want to use technology whether it's to remind them to take their medicine or or even motion sensors to alert you when they're getting up on their own and they shouldn't like there are motion sensors and um, um, pads and, and cushions, seat cushions, floor cushions, uh, bed pads that can alert you when they're getting up. Of course, there are the video monitors that are that our motion sensor triggered. So you want to use technology to prevent danger and to give to alert you. You're also going to do certain routine checks besides the preventive regular assess and reassess. You're going to check the refrigerator on a regular basis. Um, um, people with dementia might eat spoiled food, might eat moldy food, might eat raw food. Um, you want to you, you, certain places have to be checked on a regular basis. Um, garbage disposal you, you know that's that's pretty unsafe a person could put their finger in there or the wrong thing in there these are things that have to be looked at strategically and may have to be turned off or access may have to be um controlled so to create an alzheimer safe space we want to minimize danger and in the remaining time we have, which is almost 20 minutes, I want to focus not so much on the rooms, on, on the different senses because they change. Like we said before, um, the, the sense may be okay, but the brain is not interpreting it right. So what, what potentials for disaster are connected with seeing, with taste, with touch? That's I want to look at it from that perspective. That's another way besides doing the visual um, scan and tour of the house. And besides looking for danger spots, which were our key guiding principles, let's talk about the senses as opposed, and if we have time, we'll get to the rooms. So people with dementia and or, or Alzheimer's and or Alzheimer's may not see, smell, touch, hear, or taste things the way they used to. And you can do things around the house to make things easier and safer for them. Now, even though, so let's start with vision. The vision may be technically the same, but they may not interpret what they are seeing. The sense of depth perception may be altered as well. So these can cause safety concerns. You, for example, the carpeting and the, the walls should be different colors, should be contrast. No more cream carpeting, cream walls. You don't want a, a wraparound environment. They need those little triggers to, rem, to, to remind them, this is, flo this is floor, this is wall. We're going to talk about triggers for the senses because because they're not working right. The brain is not interpreting that. Similarly, this is something I didn't know about till just recently. Patterns, patterns in a rug, patterns in, in, in wall coverings can be very disorienting. They can't distinguish that it's on a carpet or it's on, a, on the draperies. What, I see snakes. They're not delusional. They're not paranoid. Those paisley things can, can trigger or be associated with frightening things. So um, very busy patterns, even if it's a very strong chevron, big, bold, up and down um, um, patterns, 
may be very confusing, just like the intricate patterns might be confusing. You want, they may see the step, but the brain is not interpreting it. So put a colorful piece of tape at the edge of the steps and outside you're gonna do fluorescent lighting. It's not so much a vision thing, it's a trigger. Hey, something's different here. It's, it's, it's an alert. Um, similarly, a mirror can be very disorienting, very frightening to an old person with dementia issues. They don't realize that it's just reflecting something else. They don't realize that it's reflecting, you know, the pictures in the living room are being reflected into the hallway and their whole sense of vision is, is, is all awry, is off kilter. So similarly, um, ref anything that reflects, we're going to have to sit, put a little sticker on a, a window pane at eye level or on the big panes in a, a break front or a, a room divider that's glass to, to trigger, hey, there's something here. They may see it, but not realize. I see people nodding. So, so um, we want to, to put that alert there. And here's another one, contrast. Contrast for functionality a cup and a saucer, a bowl and a placemat. You don't want them to be the same color. I mean, this is at a certain point. If there's a contrast, it's two different things. They may, they may, you don't want them picking up the saucer and bringing it to their mouth. If they're the same color and they fade into the tablecloth or the placemat, that's gonna happen. Okay, so dark against light, bright, against dark, different pattern against solid. You want to, to show contrast so it's easier to use something and perceive something and navigate an area. And talking about sight, people with dementia are still able to read. Um, and with Alzheimer's till the last stage, they say, they can still read. So you can use signs. You can use a simple sign, bathroom, um, kitchen, closet, steps. You know, that in, in certain style of, of construction, I think it was, the, I don't know, the 40s, they, they had the door to the basement steps. You, you just went right down. You know, you open the door and the, you, you could tumble right down. You either block off that, you block off those steps. Those are really awful because one step and they're gone, they're down the steps. So you block it off or in the beginning, you can put a little sign there, steps or a little, or, or take a picture, print it out, steps. Um, if you have a long hallway with many doors, you're gonna label the doors or put a picture there. As a reminder, a verbal cue. Um, they may have to pause and read and think about what it is and exert themselves but there is a visual trigger, something's different here, this may not be what you think it might be, et cetera. Think, are, we, are we together with this? We get that? Pretty straightforward. Okay. Or danger, how about danger? The shed, skull and crossbones, not for poison, but dangerous equipment. You wanna keep it locked, but we, we said we want redundancy, we want extra backup. Okay, let's go to touch. People who have dementia may experience loss of sensation and can may not be able to sense hot and cold or discomfort. And um, very typical in people with diabetes as well to lose sensory, um, lose sensation in the feet and the hands, the extremities. So, um, they may feel numbness. So it's hard for them um, to notice changes in flooring. Or if you are numb, when you're taking a step, you have a place and one foot in the another place. You, you may not be able to distinguish the difference in height, the difference in texture. This is carpeting, this is bare floor. So keep that in mind. 
um, the body cannot sense the difference in texture. And the, um, so you may want to put a stripe there, a stripe of, of, of tape. Um, and you, besides the, the safety issue, you're also helping them with dignity because they feel bad. They feel stupid. They feel frustrated when they fumble around and they can't figure it out. They can't manage. I need help is the worst barrier to overcome. They will struggle. They will put themselves at risk of falling and of all kinds of things because they will not say, I need help. And that's normal. So we want to reduce frustration with touch. And we want to we want to reduce danger. So we're going to move the thermostat down for the hot water heater to 120. We're going to label the faucets blue and red or hot and cold. We're going to put signs near the toaster, the, the broiler, the iron. It could be stop, do not touch. It could be very hot. Um, and of course, you don't leave them plugged in and you don't let them use it unsupervised. Similarly, um, automatic shutoffs for the stovetops. They may not feel that it's hot. Even if you have that red light, they may not connect the heat with the red light. If it's on too long, it should shut off. Um, um, also sharpness, sharp corners in furniture, sharp corners in a modern table. You want to pad those. They may not, they may see it, but they not, may not see that it's dangerous as they navigate around it. They may need some help being supported. Can't you just see someone holding onto a table as they walk around and it's very sharp, has a sharp glass top and a sharp corner? Not good. Okay. So that is our things. So you, you could either pad it or you could put tape around the edge. Most people would pad it. You don't need any accidental injuries, even if you did the precautionary actions to trigger, hey, something is different here. Now, of course, smell is an easy one. People lose their sense of smell very often. Um, and those of us who had COVID know what that is all about. So you need good smoke detectors with backups, like we said, redundancies. You need the um, um, gas leak. You need something to to make sure that the gas is detected. And you also want to do the human checks that the food is not smelly. Throw out anything that has gone bad. When you make your rounds around the house, you will do a refrigerator check like we said earlier. Now, taste. Now people hopefully can enjoy their food to the end because that motivates them to keep eating, but they may not taste. And, and so very often you have people adding a lot of spices and adding a lot of salt and adding a lot of sugar because their sense is impaired. And they want to enjoy food. What else? They don't have that many pleasures left. So you have to pay attention if they're using too many spices and too much sugar or salt. It could be dangerous, especially in the salt situation. You may have to take it away or, or dilute it. You, you have to be strategic, see what's going on. You may have to put away lotions and toothpaste and alcohol and perfume and laundry um, packets because they may seem like food to a person with Alzheimer's. Things like the little kitchen magnets on the refrigerator, a bunch of grapes. They're very often food magnets. They look like food, they may ingest them, and oh. So you're going to have poison control um, number in a few places, as well as your number, their number, their address, um, all the emergency numbers, the doctor, uh, the health plan, all the numbers should include poison control in case they ingest something that they should not. Um, and there many people as, it, as a precaution will go and take a Red Cross safety course and learn the Heimlich maneuver or some basic um, safety 
procedures so that they can respond and not wait for first responders. So that's a wise investment for any human being, a parent of young children, a responsible citizen, and the adult child of an elderly parent with dementia. Um, I believe our last sense we did taste, touch, smell, sight is hearing. Um, people with dementia may have ordinary hearing. They may not necessarily have hearing loss, but they lose their ability, as you know, to interpret what they hear. So they might be overstimulated. They might get confused. So we are not going to play the TV, the radio, or music too loudly. And we're certainly not going to play them at the same time. It's too much for a person to process, too sensory overload, right? Um, limit the number of people who are visiting at one time. And everybody notices their family members' limits. It took me a very, very long time to convince my cousins that more than three people could not, would not make for a good visit for their mother. You know, it makes atmosphere, it, but you're not really engaging. And if you take uh, a, a person with this kind of impairment to a large gathering, there's action, a parade, there's, there's movement, um, there's a lot to see, there's a spectacle, but they get sensory overload. It's too much to process. And then they kind of pull in. You literally see them withdraw and have a blank, vacant look. That me, I mean, you know this about your own loved ones, but I, I saw it um, even before I learned about this. It's too much. They can't process. Um, similarly, with sound, if it's noisy outside and the neighbors are having a family reunion and there are 40 people in their backyard, shut the window, go retreat to the other end of the house. And of course, everybody knows who's dealing with a, a senior, you gotta change the batteries on the, on the hearing devices on a regular basis. It's not just recharge them, you get new ones, fresh ones. I think the latest ones don't require that, but till very recently, fresh brand new batteries all the time, every other day, every day, made a world of a difference to the hearing of the person that I know. So there are other, that basically is a wrap. I can go through some, some, some various rooms, but I think we've covered a lot. I just want to just touch on some things that people might not think of without going into each room. Um, one of the things that I didn't think of when I studied this, and I always have a little post-it or a, a highlighter, is the junk drawer. When we talk about the kitchen, all those random items, they're small. They're a challenge. They want to, it's not easy to remember why, what they are and what they're doing there. Those are dangerous. You may, that's a chief place besides the scissors and the, and, and the, uh, the detergents, that's a place you want to lock because the items are small and they're random. Um, I think that's basically it. I mentioned the magnets on the refrigerator. Oh, here's another one. You know, as far as out, when I talk about the outside approaches to the house and letting people in and safety, we talked about the shelf, we talked about widening the doorways and the uh, unmanageable un lock. Um, and lighting and, 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 and a railing and so on. Because safety is such a big concern, you may want to put it out a no soliciting sign on the front door and display all your all the possible alarm signs. You don't want them interviewing someone who's coming to the door and making the decision. You want to keep everybody away unless there's a reason for them to be there because they don't know how to handle. Similarly, many people, this, many people have the answering machine answer like after two rings because they don't want the senior talking to some solicitor 
and some scam scammer on the phone. You don't want them engaging in conversation. So then they're somewhat isolated. How do you know who's calling? Uh, can they read the display on the on the um, caller ID? You know, these are questions that you have to answer, but these are things that you wouldn't normally think about. Kind of when the person has dementia, in a way you want to isolate them in their own home because you're afraid of outsiders, but you want to make whoever does come in and try to invite friends and so on as safe as possible and also have dedicated areas where they do the things that they enjoy together. They love playing canasta. She's finally coming over with her aid. She's visiting with your mother who has her aid. She's letting her in. They made up the time. She, the aide checks who it is. They come in, they settle down in the corner that is cleared where there is a card table set up. So the activities are thought through. She's doing her little word searches. She's watching TV. That area is the TV area. That is the book area where the pencils are kept. A lot of stuff is kept out. So we have, it's kind of just like, I hate to say this, but just the comparison with kids is always there. Just like we have, we have keep dangerous things out of sight and we watch the temperature. We also have the stations, like in kindergarten, you have the dress up and the art station and the, uh, I don't know, the sand table. We have designated areas, not random areas, areas in the house where, where activities that the person enjoys are done and, and the requirements are right there and they are safe and there's no piles of newspaper there and so on. So I think I have said a lot. Now I am open for questions again and I will catch my breath. <laughs> Are there any questions? I, I really wanna thank you, Fagy. This was excellent. Um, I've learned so much and um, I'm sure other people um, felt the same way. Um, so I really wanna thank you. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome, Gabriella and Leslie and Adina. Let's, you know, I think I indicated this, but this is a journey. This is a journey, as, as you know, and there are a lot of supports. I myself, I, I lost my father at the beginning of COVID, but I joined the AAR page, Facebook page for people with Alzheimer's just to, in preparation for this. People, it's a closed group, but given my background, I guess they let me, I think it's a closed group. I don't even know, I don't remember. But like I said, I didn't give the dementia piece of this before, but, What's nice is in that group, people present their personal situations. Not, you know, I, I'm, you know, my father insists on whatever, whatever. This is the way he likes to do this, and I'm nervous about that. Any ideas? It's it's constantly people presenting and other people chiming in, and it it seems to be mostly, you know, normal activities. Not ADLs, walking, eating, toileting, but the things that give them joy and also some of the navigational issues. So I, I, I think, yeah, it's an AARP um, um, dementia caregivers group, I think. Um, and I think I posted there about this, about this talk, but I, I think it can be when you don't, everybody's Loved one has a different situation, different way of doing things. And, and so the questions are very individual. Not every expert that you consult, Adina will not know about every single dingle thing. Um, so um, um, it's a way of reaching peers for direct support and people give support. They give strategies left and right. They're there for each other, which is nice. It's a community, There's a lot of people in it, but you can hear what other people are doing. That may help Thank solve. You. And thank you for all of your work on this. Um, it's, yes. okay, it's eight o'clock, so um, I guess we'll finish. But thank you so much, and uh, everybody for coming. You're welcome. Sorry. My pleasure. Why don't you put my email in the chat box so if people need to reach me and have a question? Sure. Um, let me get your email. <laughs> you want to, you, can you just give it to me? Because otherwise, I have to go into my phone. S Horowitz. F H O. R-O-W-I-T-Z at caringprof, like professor, 
C-A-R-I-N-G-P-R-O-F dot, dot com. We're a traditional home care company. Caring Prof, no S, just P-R-O-F? Yeah, caringprof.com. We provide, you know, home health aids to Medicaid patients, Medicare, oh, private pay patients, Holocaust survivors. Those are our specialties. And I'm the person, the in-house person who educated herself and got a credential on the home mods because I saw that this was coming. And um, I'm happy to give this, you know, and I'm happy I was forced into talk, uh, learning about the particular needs of dementia patients. As I said, it's more a matter of strategies about safety and the constant reassessing as well than, than making the major changes in the house. So I thank you for being such a good audience and your questions. And um, thank you, Adina. It's been a long time till, it was a long road till we got here, but a great road once we got to the destination. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Okay, thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.